good day and uh, today we're just going to be um this message is going to be an intro into our seven core values as a local community that we're launching throughout uh, september october time and they represent the heart of what we feel as a leadership that this community is all about and the, the seven core values which we're going to be introducing over the next few weeks are number one, enjoy and encounter the living God. Number two, to enable transformation through the spirit and the word. Number three, establish ourselves as a house of prayer. Number four, empower believers for everyday mission. Number five, earnestly desire the expression of the spiritual gifts. Number six, expand the influence of God's kingdom in our local community. And number seven, encourage Christ-centered community in the local, national and global church. And whilst these values are common ones, perhaps shared with most if not all Christians and we believe them especially true for us in our local community and we as a, a leaders are praying into what God might have for us here in the parks and we felt drawn to the story of Israel and their arriving in the land of promise so turn with me to Exodus 23 verse 20 to 23 here we read God saying I am going to send an angel before you to protect you as your journey and to bring you into the place that I have prepared. Take heed because of him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if you diligently obey him and do all that I command, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and I will be an adversary to your adversaries. For my angel will go before you and bring you to the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will destroy them completely. Now, I've mentioned before uh, many times that the New Testament identifies Jesus with the angel of the Lord. And we shouldn't get upset about the word angel because it just means messenger. It's the messenger of the Lord. And this passage is paralleled in Judges 2, 1 to 5, when we read, the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum, and he said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land that I solemnly promised to give your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, but you must not make an agreement with the people who live in this land. You should tear down the altars where they worship, but you've disobeyed me. Why would you do such things? At that time, I also warned you, if you disobey, I will not drive out the Canaanites before you. They will ensnare you and their gods will lure you away. Notice that this angel, we can tell is a special angel. He's, he's different from other angels uh, because he says, I brought you up out of Egypt. I led you into the land that I had promised to give to your ancestors. The angel talks and it's God who speaks. He's the power to forgive sins as well. And he's got the name of God that dwells within him. And this links to the idea in, in John's gospel as well, with Jesus revealing the name, you know, um, to people. Um, and in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 6 to 9, Paul writes, These things happened as examples for us so that we will not crave evil things as they did. And he's referring to the Exodus and the, the wanderings of the Israelites. He said, so, uh, verse 7 so do not be idolaters as some as there were as it is written the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play and let us not be immoral as some of them were and twenty three thousand died in a single day but let us not put christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by snakes notice how paul equates the angel of the lord with jesus christ happily saying let us not put christ to the test as some of them did and in Jude 5, we read, Now I desire to remind you, even though you have fully been informed of these facts once for all, that Jesus, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, later destroyed those who did not believe. So Jude, like Paul, is equating Jesus as the one who led the Israel through the Exodus into the wilderness. And we should take note that it's Jesus who makes the promises to Israel, and it is Jesus who will deliver them. 
And this is the same for us, that Jesus has given us the promise of the new covenant, that the Lord is going to write the Torah, the, the law inside us upon our hearts, no longer upon tablets of stone that are external to us, but rather written upon the human heart. And that he's going to change us and transform us on the inside into the very likeness and image of Jesus Christ, the very image of God. So in verse 23, we're told, For my angel will go before you and will bring you to the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and I will destroy them completely. Friends, there are giants in the land. Because the conquest of Canaan is a troubling passage for many people, I just want to share what the events probably meant in Israelites' own context here. Um, so what is, and then I'm going to share what it means for us here in the parks. So a careful reading of the conquest narratives of Canaan. And you will notice that the places where Joshua and the Israelites attacked are linked directly to various clans of giants who are said to be living in the land. So at the end of the book of Joshua, in Joshua 11, 22, we're told none of the descendants of Anak, so that's the Anakim, this giant clan, are left in all of the land of Israel although some remained in Gaza, Gath and Ashdod. So the purpose of Joshua's devote this city to destruction, devote the people to destruction, is um, a command to destroy these giant clans who are living there. And that's the reason for the book of Joshua. And within all ancient cultures, there's stories of the lost golden age that was destroyed in a flood. And there's a small group of survivors who managed to survive. And in the Babylonian version, uh, these beings called the Akalu reveal to humans secret knowledge. Uh, but the other gods become angry with them and then they imprison them in the abyss, which is the depths of the waters below the rivers. However, the, the kings of Babylon, the Amorite kings, claim to possess this secret knowledge from before the flood that had been handed down to them. And in the Israelite version of the story, we're told in Genesis 6, when the sons of God came down and married with human women, they gave birth to the Nephilim. And that obviously links to the Canaan with the giants, because when they arrive um, in the book of Numbers, we see that the Nephilim are in the, in the land and the Anakim are descendants of the Nephilim. OK, so when Genesis was translated into Greek in 250 B.C., the 70 Jewish scribes in Alexandria translated sons of God as angels of God. And they translated Nephilim as giants because this is their worldview. This is how they're, they're understanding what's happened. So when we think about giants, we shouldn't think about DNA. We shouldn't think about tribes or very tall people. Um, why wipe out people just because they're tall? You know, um, We've got these ideas of ethnicity and race that the ancient authors aren't thinking about. OK. The focus is on ritual identity and the scholar uh, Stephen D. Young um, from the Lord of Spirits podcast, he uses the example of being an American. You have certain rituals to participate in, like celebrating the 4th of July, Thanksgiving, voting, but also initiate rituals to join in with the group. So you've got citizenship tests and then you swear an oath to the flag. It, it's a ritual. And having passed through those things, you're now an American. And it's the same for us Christians. We, we join this group uh, called the church through a ritual called baptism. And then we maintain fellowship through a ritual meal that we have called communion. And these are visible identity markers of being a Christian, where it marks us out from the community around us as being different. And to become an Israelite, you, you were circumcised and then you ate Passover. And this is important that there are, are people in the Exodus story who are not physically descended from Abraham, who even become leaders within Israel. And it's nothing to do with their DNA. It's about their ritual participation. They are Israelites because they ritually participate as Israelites. And so in Exodus 12, tw uh, 38, we're told that a mixed multitude left Egypt in the Exodus. Two obvious examples of this are Caleb and Phineas. Uh, Caleb is called an elder of the tribe of Judah. He's one of the two good spies, him and Joshua. And yet in Numbers 13, 6, he's referred to as a Kenizzite, which is one of the Canaanite tribes. So this elder of the tribe of Judah, who scouted out the land on behalf of the 
tribe of Judah is ethnically a Canaanite. And the, another example is Phineas, whose name literally means the black man or the Nubian from the south of Egypt. Uh, he's spoken of as Aaron's grandson and the tribe of Levi. And later he even becomes high priest, you know, over Israel. But ethnically, he's a black African who's become high priest over Israel. What matters is their ritual identity. You know, he's adopted into this priestly family. And Caleb and Phineas are no less sons of Abraham by faith than anyone else, just as we're all sons of Abraham, because we, by faith, worship it, the God of Abraham. Uh, people weren't members of these giant clans just because they happen to be born into a certain tribal family. Rather, they've gone through all these initiation rituals. They've participated in the ritual life of the clan. And within Jewish tradition, in books like First Enoch, the ritual life of these clans is spoken of as containing idolatry, sexual immorality, cannibalism, the drinking of human blood. And many of the laws in the Torah are asking Israel not to do the things that those clans did. And based upon the cultic texts that we have from the Amorites, the likely scenario is this. You know, that Genesis 6 and other things are referring to is that the king of the city state would dress up as the local god. He would put a mask on. He would dress up as the god and then he would summon his dead ancestors to possess him and the god to possess him and to be witnesses of this ritual. And then he would ritually have intercourse with a temple prostitute on a ritual bed to bring fertility for the crops and for the fields and cement an agreement between the God and the people. And a child born of this ritual was thought to be a demigod because the God would have possessed the king's body when he was doing the ritual. And this is, uh, you know, an example of this would be in Deuteronomy 3.11, when we told the Og, one of the last of the giants, one of the last of the Rephaim, uh, has this giant bed, you know, it's not about the length of the bed in terms of that's how big he is. It's more the fact that he has, he's participating in this ritual. And this ritual would be accompanied by cannibalism and with eating human blood or drinking human blood, I should say. So the purpose of this ritual for the fallen angels uh, view is sort of an anti-creation. It's to create human beings after their own image and likeness. And whilst we're called to become like Christ, these people are to become like the fallen angels, like demons. Uh, to be a giant, therefore, is to be a fully demonized person. It's the total opposite of being a saint. So the conquest of Canaan is not about genocide or anything like that. It's basically a war against vampires, literally a war against vampires. It's clans of people obsessed with violence with all these sexual immorality who are drinking human blood. So in Jewish thought, demons are these spirits of these killed giants. They're fully demonized spirits. And the scholar John Walton compares the conquest to the Allies having conquered Germany in World War II and going around removing all the Nazi symbols and images, destroying the cultural identities, taking down all the swastikas and no one swearing oaths to Hitler anymore. So the Israelites had to go in there and destroy this cultural identity of these people. Um, so as an aside, the ancestors of these these people, the Amorites, are called the Titanu. Um, and they're the ones that the king asked to possess him. And that's where the Greeks get the name Titans from. They're the ones who imprisoned within Tartarus. So they're the old gods, as it were. So hence Second Peter 2, 4, where Peter writes, For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but rather sent them to Tartarus, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. So in this Jewish worldview, one of the reasons that the world is so messed up is because of all this secret knowledge that was passed on before the flood, but also after the flood in these bloodlines of these people doing these rituals, um, and who built all the first cities. If you read the Bible account, you know, it's Cain and his descendants who are the ones who are building the cities, built all the first cities. They're the one who form all the, the first weapons and forge iron and all these things and have spells and potions and all these things. Um, and whilst they can be good things, you know, they can be good um, and they can be used for good. 
Often they're used only for evil and for the increase of evil. We're getting better and better at killing ourselves. Now we have nuclear weapons capable of mass destruction. Park um, North and Park South estates are built during the 1950s when Swindon was this designated as this overspill area of London and the farmlands of the former Goddard estate are developed into housing. And for many of the families escaping the overcrowding of London, the houses of the parks were luxurious by comparison. And friends, in a way, this is our, our own promised land, the parks. It's got its fair share of giants, not in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense. And the parks is amongst the 10% most deprived neighbourhoods in the country. We have problems of low income, high unemployment, uh, low skills and jobs training, poor health, High, high crime rates, especially around drugs and gangs, broken families and vulnerable seniors. There's some big giants in the land. But our promised land is the new heavens and the new earth. And during our wandering on earth, we're called to seek the welfare of the place in which we live. In Jeremiah 29, 7, the Israelites are told, Work to see that the city where I've sent you as exiles enjoys peace and prosperity. Pray to the Lord for it. For as it prospers, so too you will prosper. Friends, we wish to see the parks prosper. And as we enter the land, we have knowledge that our Lord God and Saviour, our captain and commander, is going before us, just as he went before Israel. And he's promised in Matthew 28, 20, I am with you always until the very end of the age. And this should give us hope that we're not going on our own, but rather we're here with Christ. He's with us. And when looking at the giants, as we, like the Israelites perhaps, might feel a bit overwhelmed. How can we few hope to affect some of the issues that I mentioned here this morning? There's big giants in the land. But there are ways. Our, our food boxes for hungry families in partnership with the school. Uh, thank you for everyone who's donated to that fund and has bought and delivered a box. This is one way to slay that giant of hunger. Our work with Christians Against Poverty within this community. I know that a number of the ladies have accompanied Jeff on visiting people within this local community. This is another way to slay that giant of debt and low income. Job skills courses. Kaylee a few years ago ran a jobs course in the school and, uh, and it was excellent and it went so well. And our biggest need at the moment is somewhere midweek where we can do those sorts of things. And before us, there are many opportunities for giant slaying, parenting courses, alpha courses, community barbecues and fun days. And in James 1, 27, we're told pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Friends, the greatest way to overcome giants is to receive that internal change of heart, that new covenant. Um, which is received as the blood of Christ, you know, that we drink in, in communion, which, you know, he says, this cup is the new covenant that comes inside us and cleanses us on the inside, writes the law upon our hearts. Uh, James refers to us as refusing to let the world corrupt you. We turn away from the destructive patterns of behaviour, the addictive lifestyles that we once lived and turn to God. And then he fills us with his holy love. His very presence. Paul's words in Colossians 1 27, God wanted to make known to them the glorious riches, uh, this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. But for each of us, we have the duty to our neighbour. James says pure and genuine religion in the sight of God, the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress. Caring for the vulnerable in society is what genuine religion is all about. And over the next few weeks, um, I think we can think through these values as a community and challenge each of us to think about the ideas and ways in which we can be a light in this community. Ways in which we can connect and we can release faith hope and love within this local community. So returning to Exodus 23 and the angel of the Lord going ahead of them, we read in verses 28 to 30, we read, I will send hornets before you that will drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, the Hittites before you. I will not drive them out before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the wild animals multiply against you. 
Little by little I will drive them out before you until you become fruitful and inherit the land. Friends, it is the, the little by little that wins the day. The tortoise, not the hare, wins the race. And often we might go day to day thinking, I'm making no difference to the people around me. But when we look back, there will be this wonderful pattern of how we've changed all those around us and influenced people towards God. We can only know how important the present is in light of the end. We will look back and see how important this moment was for us. And I love the fact that it's hornets, the, you know, vicious bees that are going to drive out the nations rather than armies. We, friends, are the bees of the hive of Christ. We're scattered servants carrying out daily labours in the world. A John Chrysostom, an early Christian, once said, the bee is more honoured than other animals, not because she labours, but because she labours for others. May we say with Paul in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So the life I now live in the body, I live because of the faithfulness of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We live because he lived for us. Galatians 5.24 says, Now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. May that be true of all of us today. You know, the, as James says about true religion, that is to prevent ourselves from being corrupted. Um, can we say with Paul that our lives are no longer our own, that we've been bought with a price? That, is that our attitude? That it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me? Such a reality should touch upon every aspect of our lives, how we use our time, how we use our money, how what jobs we choose, the people that we invest in, the people that we use our spare time with. If Christ lives in us, then what we do with our bodies really do matter because it's Christ's body. So in conclusion, friends, just as Israel stood at the very end edge of the land, led by the angel of the Lord. So we stand at the edge of the land, led by the Lord Jesus. Giants await us, and yet we're called little by little to chip away at them taking the ground. Just as Joshua rededicated Israel, so we should challenge ourselves to see if we really are following in the way of Christ. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we just... Bring that challenge before each one of us, Lord, that just as Joshua was entering into the land of Israel, Israel rededicated themselves to the Lord. And so, Lord, we rededicate ourselves, our own lives, Lord, as we lift them up as living sacrifices to you, to be your hands and your feet wherever we go. Amen.